All right, we're ready to begin. Good evening. Uh, welcome, everyone, to 44Con. And I can't see any one of you here. I can just see two bright lights. So if you're waving, I advise you to jump up to catch my attention. Um, right, let's uh, begin. Um, uh, I've, I've got quite a lot of things to say in no particular order. So first, let me just start with my introduction. My name is Saumil Shah. I've been doing InfoSec for several years now, enough to be called a bitter old man. Um, and from time to time, I kind of uh, work upon a few things during my spare time, which is rapidly shrinking. And over the past few years, I've been trying to play around with web hacking, browser hacking, exploit development, and photography. And the result of all this is this particular talk. So, a few of you uh, would have already known what Stegosploit is. Um, I first talked about this at Hack in the Box Amsterdam in May. And then if you search for it, there's all sorts of signal and noise all over the web. Um, initially, everybody was saying good things about it, and then people started saying crazy things about it, and then the people started saying really bad things about it. But today, nobody knows what Stegosploit really is. We got to see it for ourselves. All right, so here we go, what it is. <coughs> so my work with exploit development has always been um, in two arenas. On one hand, you're always trying to write the latest and greatest exploit, the next ODA, the most advanced techniques for bypassing mitigation techniques like uh, DEP and ASLR, you do info leaks and all that. But what good is an exploit? What good is a powerful exploit if it is not delivered in style? You gotta make it sway so smooth that people actually like being exploited. That's what we call a style, <laughs> right? So I started working, how do you combine exploits, all this ugly looking code into pretty pictures that people go, ah, and then they go, oh shit. Um, um, and after the talk, somebody uh, put out a brilliant quote. I wish I know who this individual is, but I like this quote. Uh, Protocol spanning syntax-based generalized exploit methodologies are the new black. Um, and um, there's, there's a lot of uh, power to this. We are already seeing um, attackers trying to innovate the process of exploit delivery. I mean, there's two things that will make an exploit succeed. It's freshness, that is a zero-day factor, and successful traversal without detection. I am trying to focus upon the latter, because I'm not as cool enough as the other folks in the audience to develop zero-day exploits. So a quick overview of history as to how um, a little bit of background about images and trying to combine different elements together in the same blob. So we know of steganography since several years now, decades even. The art of secret writing, encoding secret messages inside images, so visually there's no disturbance. The messages will pass innocently without inspection or without raising suspicion. And the person, the receiver, who knows that there's a message knows how to retrieve the message from the image. Um, and then, um, Billy Rios and a couple of smart guys, I forget when, 2004, 5, 6, I don't remember, they came out with a clever technique of combining Java archives and GIF files together, creating what's called a GIFR, or, or sort of like a Chimera or a Frankenstein file, which now, today, the word used is polyglots. A file or a piece of data that has different meaning when opened or viewed under different context. Um, so GIFR was used, you can upload a GIF file on Facebook and then serve it as a Java applet somewhere else. Pretty fun stuff. Then came along the whole uh, game of encoding web shells in EXIF data. So you have JPEG files, you have camera, camera settings, camera comments, lens type, and everything recorded in EXIF or IPTC data. Instead, you can just start putting arbitrary strings there, and you can put PHP shells or ASP shells and upload the whole thing as a picture on a server. 
So if a, if a server is accepting your profile picture, you upload it, fake an extension like .php or .aspx, then you've got a web shell, you own the server. So this is already done. And then, of course, we have to have classic cross-site scripting in Exif data. So if you view it under Flickr or something like an Exif viewer, you get uh, JavaScript owned back. Stegosloid is nothing of this. It's, it's not JFR, it's not a PHP web shell, it's not cross-site scripting. Stegosloid is just an exploit delivery mechanism. So my motivations, uh, I like photography, I like browser exploits. So I like photography combined with browser exploits, and that is what it is. It's not an attack with a cute logo, although there is a cute logo with it. Um, it is not exploit code hidden in EXIF. It is not a web shell. It's not a new cross-site scripting vector. It is simply a delivery mechanism that lets you deliver browser exploits as pure images. In transit, nobody knows that there's an exploit riding on this picture of a pretty cat. Images are innocent. Nobody thinks twice when looking at images. And the cuter the image, the more it is looked at, but in a good way. Exploits, however, are not. Exploits are fairly dangerous. So um, yeah, when there's a tigress coming at you at, at five feet of distance between your car, you really start thinking, what am I going to do? Dangerous content is dangerous. So how do we turn a dangerous attack into something that will go smoothly without raising any alerts? So first thing, you break it up into two. You take the attack content and split it into two parts. You separate the dangerous content and encode it on pixels in an image. Now, the resultant stuff you have is an image with slight variations in pixel values. Very slight that the human eye cannot even notice. And then you have a little decoder, something to decode the steganography. And this is also some very simple piece of code. Ideally, it's nothing but a loop and running through arrays and adding values and subtracting values and creating a little string. So um, none of these will ever raise any any alarms when they travel across the wire under suspicious eyes. Today, browser exploit delivery is done rather simplistically. You serve an exploit, or you iframe it, a browser connects to it, it gets owned. There's all sorts of people and things and boxes and you know, um, fire eyes and crowd strikes and all your cyber cyber things watching the wires. So what do you do if you really want to get past them? Well, actually, it's simple to get past all of these. Um, you obfuscate the exploit. You use some weird JavaScript encoding. You, you know, use like non-alphanumeric JavaScript or split it apart. You do several redirects. It'll go through. But this is what it is today. I am thinking about what it's going to be tomorrow. Um, and already, attacks like this have been observed. I have written a paper. And uh, the technique that I was discussing in 2010 was used in an attack in 2014 as a grayscale pixelated image. Um, the future, however, is going to be uh, complex forms of exploit delivery. Um, I'll explain to you what Stegosploit does at a very high level. You have an exploit, you want to deliver it to a browser. So rather than deliver it plainly, you take an image, you combine it steganographically with an encoder. Now, the browser should be able to decode it using a decoder. Here lies a little bit of a challenge. What do you send first, the decoder or the image? And I thought, forget it. I send both of them together as one entity. So you combine the decoder code, which is JavaScript code, with pixels, which is an image, combine them into a single polyglot and deliver it together. And this is what will cause the browser to get owned and compromised. That is Stegosploit in a nutshell. What do we get out of it? So the network traffic sees only image files flying across the wire. 
The exploit is completely hidden in pixels, uh, both from network traffic and from human inspection. There is no visible aberration or distortion. Uh, the polyglot part of the exploit, the image itself behaves differently if loaded directly in the browser. Not under an image tag, but directly as a separate URL. In this case, the image is no longer an image. The image behaves as a perfectly valid HTML file, and it will auto-run the moment you open it in the browser. When it auto-runs, the decoder kicks in, decodes all the pixels, delivers the exploit, and there you are, ownage. And all this happens with just one image, no more. So let me show you how it's done. I'll give you a quick overview of the steganography part of things. I am no, in, in no capacity an expert in steganography. I'm just a guy who's figured out how to put a few things on pixels. The stego stuff in here is very, very simple. However, it's too simple. It's so simple that steganography detection engines can't detect it. Um, so the first step is how do you hide the exploit code in the image itself? Um, it's very simple. You take the string of JavaScript, break it up into a bit stream, spread the bits across as least significant bits on some pixel values, um, and there you go. The greater you spread it across the image, the better it will be. Um, so here's the demo I did in Amsterdam earlier. This is a picture of my friend Kevin McPeak. He and I were standing outside the Bourse van Berlag, the, the oldest stock exchange in the world. And I said, Kevin, I'm just going to take a photo of you and paint an exploit on your face and then blow up browsers with it. He said, OK, let's do this. So on the, um, I am directionally challenged. On that side of Kevin, I don't know which is right or left, is the exploit code. This is all the JavaScript. It is uh, basically a use after free exploit, fairly new. This thing is going to go on Kevin's face. So this is CV 2014-0282. All right, so how does steganography work? Simple steganography 101. When you think of an image, think of a pile of transparencies stacked together. Think of eight transparencies. Each transparency forms a bit layer. The topmost paper, the topmost sheet, is the most significant bit. Anything you draw on the top contributes maximum information content to the image. And as you keep drawing details down at the bottom, you'll contribute to greater detail but less information. So if I separate Kevin's image into its constituent bit layers, as I call it, the most significant bit looks like uh, the picture we see over there. You see a broad outline. You can see his face. You can see the glasses. You can see his hand. And then as you keep on going down the bit layers, the information content decreases and the entropy or the detail increases. And here are all the bit values. You have, um, this is bit layer 7, if you zoom in. And then you go down to bit layer 5. Bit, and bit layer 0 is just nothing but details. So now how are we going to put data on top of this? We'll take the bit stream of JavaScript, and we'll just start writing on any layer of our choice every fourth pixel or every fourth bit will be altered and replaced by the bits in our, um, in our JavaScript. If we write everything on the top, on the topmost sheet, you're actually going to add distortion to the image. When you combine all the sheets together, your image will look, oops, your image will actually look like this. You, you'll see all the, all the aberrations. However, if you just take the top few sheets off and start writing at a lower layer, your resultant image will have little or no distortion. Um, here is the result of the exploit encoded at bit layer 2. You can't see anything. The whole exploit is there. Let's do this. I'll give you a quick demo, and we will see this 
in action. So let me go to my tools. I hope these things work because demos have this horrible property of failing when you most need them to behave well. Um, right on. Now, the other thing about Stegosploit is all these tools are written in JavaScript. They can be run in a browser. You don't need anything fancy. The reason why it's all in JavaScript is because I need everything to be decoded in JavaScript. So I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible and let the browser do all the heavy lifting, including pixel manipulation. Um, okay, let me search for my... So here is a... Uh, let me see if I can enlarge this a little bit for better readability. So here's a tool for analyzing images. Uh, I can load up a picture in here. I don't have all the fancy jQuery to make dialog box pop-ups, I'm sorry. And here is the picture. On the uh, other side of Kevin, you can see the histogram, the frequency distribution. And down below, this is a view of all the bit layers individually. Here is bit layer seven, and if I keep going down bit layers six, five, four, three, two, one, and zero, you see how the outlines disappear and the noise or the details increase. And if you start stacking them up, if you start superimposing them, so I'm now clicking them on one, by the, one after the other, I'm also doing some image equalization for us to visualize the pixels. If we don't do equalization, the resultant image is so faint, if I turn off equalization, you really can't see anything. That's how faint the pixels are. But you enhance them using night vision. And as we stack these up, the image starts building up. At layer five, actually, Kevin looks like the dude. He looks like the big Lebowski. Yeah. Right. So this is how the layers are. Now let us see how we can write onto it. Um, we will try to encode JavaScript on top of one of these layers. And I want to show you the effects of um, what it takes to write down lower layers. So let me do the encoder demo. Right, we'll take his picture again. load it, and here I have a few um, exploits ready to go. You can type your own code in this text box and it will layer it on there, or here are some of the exploits I wrote in, my, in the class that I was teaching, so I said might as well use those straight away. So I have a few use after free bugs. We can take uh, the C input use after free with a meterpreter, and here's the JavaScript code of it. This is all the JavaScript with the shell code and the ROP chains and all the fun stuff. And now I'm going to write it on a particular bit layer. Let me write it on bit layer 7. And I will choose a pixel grid of 3 pixels by 3 pixels. So I'm just spreading out the pixels in 3 by 3 squares. And here I'm going to click Process. So this is the um, resultant image. As you can see, the, um, the image is pretty distorted. This is, somebody's going to suspect, like, what the heck is all this in here? They're not going to like it. And here is the resultant view where I've actually just broken it up into uh, red and black dots. By the way, all these tools are available. You can play with this on your own at leisure as well. Um, I'll talk to, uh, talk to you about the tools slightly later on. Um, but notice what happens when we go down the layers. So instead of bit layer 7, I'm going to go down bit layer 5 and reprocess the image. Now you see that the pixelation is slightly 
decreasing. There is some pixelation, but it has noticeably decreased. The intensity is going away. And as I go down to bit layer two, the uh, distortion, there is no distortion. You, you really just can't tell. There's nothing visually wrong with this image. But the whole thing has been burnt on this, uh, the, the whole exploit has been burnt on this image. Well, not so fast, you will say. Um, the, the observant ones will call bullshit on this, saying, hey, this is a JPEG file, so if you actually save this, you're gonna lose pixels in compression because JPEG is not lossless compression. It will approximate nearby pixels and you will actually lose information. So I struggled with it. I actually tried to figure out how the heck can I overcome uh, um, lossy compression. And I went down a path where I was studying the discrete cosine transforms in the, in the DCT tables and tweaking those values until I hit upon a very simple solution that doesn't matter if you lose some pixels, whatever pixels are left becomes a source image, you run it in a feedback loop and keep burning the same data on top of it again and again until all the pixels come out right. Let the computer do a few loops and we'll get it accurately done. So with that, we will encode uh, the exploit in the JPEG and serve it out. By the way, if you do this on PNG, PNG is lossless. You can do it in one pass. No pixel value will be lost, and your recovery will be 100% accurate. But I like JPEG files, because I'm a photographer. So I have to have it on JPEG for me to be happy. Uh, okay, so here it is, loaded up. I'm going to encode the exploit on layer two. And, uh, the grid spacing is going to be three by three once again. The exploit of my choice is the meterpreter exploit. Here it is. Um, the C input with the meterpreter. And when I click on process, this is the first pass. Um, this is going to be the resulted image. But when I save it as JPEG, there'll be loss of information, there'll be errors. So. I'm going to click the slow motion button on and iterate through various passes. Um, with all the passes, you'll be able to observe um, what happens to the image with each subsequent pass. So I will encode the pixels, save it as JPEG, try to decode it back. There will be some errors. And here I'll calculate the delta as to how many characters are in error, what is the error rate in recovery and then take the resultant output, feed it back in, in a loop, until all the errors uh, reduce to zero. So uh, here we go. So here is the image, and on this side you can see the pixels, the, the red spots, the errors slowly disappearing, and the delta will converge from 99 to 60 to 25, and with this, even though there are some pixels that were malformed, um, the decoding is perfect, it's not bothering it, the JPEG is clean, and now you get a perfectly encoded JPEG file with no errors in steganographic recovery. This is good to go. This is good to travel on the wire without being inspected. Next step in the process is the decoding. So step one is done. Um, in fact, if you actually blow up the bit layer two, and you start inspecting into the darker areas, you'll be able to see the uh, you'll be able to see the effects of the encoding in the black regions. Like you can see some patches on his shirt still show the pixelation, um, and some pa patches in the doorway still show the pixelation. But these are too trivial to notice. This is because I've equalized the images. Right. So lossy compression overcome. PNG, no problem, there's no loss, so one pass and you're uh, going to be able to encode everything. The other advantage with PNG is it works across all browsers. JPEG encoders differ from browser to browser, so there's a little bit of uh, um, some ironing out that I still need to work into my tools uh, to make JPEG decoding perfectly um, uh, compatible across all browsers. 
Step two is how are we going to decode the pixel data? And this has to happen in the browser itself. So what's going to help us over here is HTML canvas. Beginning with HTML5, all browsers introduce the canvas element where you can manipulate images using JavaScript in the browser. And one of the features that HTML canvas allows us to do is read pixel values of a loaded bitmap. So we're going to load the steganographic image and then run this code. This is the JavaScript decoder code. It will lift every third pixel, every fourth pixel from a particular bit layer and separate the bits, assemble it back into a stream, create a string out of it, and then execute the string as JavaScript. A few of um, other researchers also called out bullshit on executing the JavaScript string because if you use eval, that's very evil and everybody will catch you for using eval. So I had to do a little bit of work inspired by Dr. Mario Heiderich, um, which who I found out has also come up with the same technique. But uh, what, uh, what fixes everything is that instead of using eval, you just create, oops, I'm trying to, yeah, you just create a new, uh, a new function object and place the string as a constructor to the function. And this will result in code being created and you just execute the function with a set timeout. So no need of eval, no signaturing there. The idea now, is to combine this JavaScript in the decoder onto the image itself and create a polyglot. So this will create an image that can auto run when loaded directly in the browser. So here's a riddle. When is, when is an image not an image? When it is JavaScript. And this uh, leads to the images toolkit that I created. This was done, the images stuff was done three years ago where if you view the data in an image viewer, it will appear as pixels. If you load the data in the DOM, it will run as code. So basically, it's a bipolar file. If you look at it from an image standpoint, it looks like an image. You run it as JavaScript, it is JavaScript. And this is how the polyglot works. This is the same file. If you read the code on, the, uh, on that side of the image, seriously directionally challenged, aren't I? Um, you say image source equals hash, which means pull the same content into itself. Hash means self. And then you see a perfectly valid image. But if you have script source equals hash, the same pixels run as a JavaScript, and it'll run JavaScript on top. So how do you now combine this with JPEG files, and how do you combine this with PNGs? This, by the way, is a GIF file. It's very easy to do in GIF. JPEG took a little bit of work. So um, we have images JPEG, which will let you combine JPEG with HTML, with JavaScript, and CSS all in one container. If you load it as JPEG, it's a perfectly valid JPEG file. If you load it in the browser directly, it's a perfectly valid HTML file, which will load itself as JavaScript and apply itself as a style sheet on top of it. Everything all in one. Um, so here's the secret sauce. The, uh, the art of polyglot creation is somewhat of, you know, gut feeling, knowing about the file format, and talking to cool guys like Angie Albertini, um, who is, I believe, the polyglot master. But I put my own humble attempt. So here's how the polyglot is done. If you look at the JPEG header and break it down, um, all your JPEG files will have what are called markers or sections. I forget the proper terminology. And your JPEG file is comprised of several markers combined together. So you have the start of the image, then you have like the DCT tables, you have the pixel tables, you have the EXIF data. Each one of them form a separate segment. And these segments start with FFD8, FFE2, FF something. These are all the, the two byte FF values indicate a start of an image. Some of these segments are prefixed with a length. So here's a start of image. You have the first few bytes as JFIF and null byte. And then you have some major and minor version numbers for JPEG. And this is a length of 16 bytes. What happens if I tweak this length and make it 2F2A? 
which is a length of 12,074. Well, this means that I get to extend this segment as long as I like. And I can put 12,000 bytes of extra rubbish in here without the JPEG uh, parser breaking. But if you look at this length value, what is 2F2A? If you turn it into characters, it is slash and star. It's the opening of a JavaScript comment. So we are overriding the length field as a comment marker in JavaScript. So when you load this as a JavaScript comment or JavaScript code, you have a variable called FFD8 FFE0 equals alert date. And then everything else is commented behind it. So you can sneak in any evil JavaScript that you like without causing any distortion in the JavaScript. Everything else, the valid JPEG data is commented away. So JavaScript and JPEG coexist and don't interfere with each other. I wish humanity can do that, but it can't. Um, with PNG, it's a very similar thing. PNG is, PNG is made up of what are called four CCs, four character codes. Everything begins with a PNG header, which is fixed, uh, and this is the exact sequence of PNG headers. And then all the other segments are length prefixed with a four character marker code, and then you have the chunk data and CRC. Somewhere in here, I can hide text markers. In fact, 4CC is a very extendable format. You can use these in AVI files and several other containers. You can mix and match 4CC tags anywhere you like. The decoder will only pick up the tags it knows of. If you sneak in your own tag, it will not interfere with the decoder. So it will preserve the integrity of the image and allow you to sneak more things in. And then with a little bit of clever placement of comments and CRCs, you're able to sneak in HTML data right in here. So with this, now let's see how we can turn this into a polyglot. So we took Kevin's image. Here is the decoder code. Um, this decoder is going to be combined with Kevin's image to form the polyglot, which will decode itself when loaded in the browser. So to do this, we have a tool, which is a part of the Stegosploit toolkit, and it's called images. Uh, we're going to use this to combine the two together. So we'll provide it an image source. Um, so we'll provide it the decoder source, the JPEG source, and the output. And everything is rolled into the output file. If I inspect this file, if I do an exif tool on it, it will show me perfectly valid exif data. All the JPEG stuff is visible. If I run the file command on it, then it passes as a very valid JPEG file. However, if I show you the innards of it, then you'll be able to spot the dodgy HTML code in here. This is because I didn't really spend too much time obfuscating it and transforming it into non-alphanumeric values. But here you have the JPEG header, you have the beginning of the comment, here you have the opening HTML, then the opening comment to mask out the JPEG data. And here is the decoder code just basically pasted in. So if somebody is looking across the wire, this is still, yes, there is still a possibility to signature this. This is what I'm working on on shrinking this and disguising this so that this part becomes hidden. And here you will see tags like image um, source equals hash. So it loads itself back in as an image. When you load this polyglot in the browser, it'll still look like an image. But you can click on it, and it'll trigger the exploit code in here. The rest of it is all JPEG data. Right, let us now deliver this and see the demo. Um, basically, it's time for me to prove that all my crap works. Um, here we go, open up a browser. I'm going to serve this using a web server. And 
Oh yeah, I have encoded it with meterpreter, so I have the uh, Metasploit uh, engine running. Let me also get the Metasploit thing out here. So here's Metasploit showing meterpreter. If all goes well, we'll have a, uh, a back connection, a reverse connection on Meterpreter, and uh, we should be able to get a shell out of this. I've also tried to upload Mimikatz and a privilege escalation trick and everything to just own everything in one package. Um, let me go and do this. I can't read is the challenge here. Okay, so here I'm just gonna load up the image as it is without any, uh, without any image tag or anything getting in the way. So here is the encoded image, Kevin C input meterpreter. I click on this. What you see in the browser is just a very simple image, but this is actually an HTML file. If you do a view source, you'll realize that this is a, uh, yeah, if you do a view source, it'll show that this is a JPEG and then it'll show all the HTML in here, all the commented out JavaScript and other stuff. Now I'm gonna click on this. The moment I click on this, we'll, uh, the exploit code will kick in. The first thing that the exploit code does is it does a heap spray. So you'll see the CPU spiking up. The heap spray is also done in HTML canvas. I'm, loading the ROP chains using pixels by creating hundreds of canvas tags. It's a little slow, but it works very well. And it is portable across every browser. So heap spray detection techniques also fail miserably because I don't know that a canvas is a heap spray. So here we go, I clicked on it and CPU spikes up. It'll stay spiked up for a while because IE's uh, canvas rendering is really slow. If this were a Firefox exploit, which I'm gonna show you a little later, the heap spring is really, really fast. So after a few seconds, if it doesn't crash, we'll get a reverse connection, and then we'll have meterpreter. There we go, meterpreter opened up. All these privilege escalations command running, screenshots taken, migrating. I think I've screwed up the meterpreter script, the migrate fails. But, uh, and then we try to do mimikatz. I think mimikatz has also failed. But nonetheless, we still have a shell. So yeah, the browser is owned at this point with a single JPEG file traveling across the wire. Um, right. Okay, let me close this down. Set. Okay, next demo is with PNG. So, let me show you a PNG demo, and this time I'm going to use color images. The PNG exploit is a, um, it's basically a Firefox exploit. So what I showed you was, I showed you the IE exploit. I'm gonna show you the Firefox on ready state change use after free bug. The idea is to demonstrate that any browser exploit can be combined with an image, be it PNG, be it JPEG, travel as pixels, use a decoder, and everything happens using HTML canvas. Ironically, IE6 is safe from this technique simply because it does not implement HTML canvas. Okay, uh, last demo coming up with Firefox, because all browsers must get owned equally. Um, let me first show you the PNG image uh, in the image uh, layer analysis code. Uh, I've, already done the, uh, I've already done the layering and put the exploit on there, but I just want to show you how it decomposes into its constituent uh, planes. Um, I'm gonna load. Uh, yeah, the 
images. Yeah, here is the image. This one is a PNG. So it's a picture of uh, another picture of a tiger. I, I like tigers, tigers very much. Um, I love to go see them in the wild, which is a beautiful thing. So this is, um, now with PNG and with color images, even in JPEG, you get the ability to play around with red, green, and blue channels. So you can combine the exploit only on one channel. In this case, I've combined it with a green channel because a large amount of pixel values are green and it will get dispersed in the, um, in the noise with the trees and the grass. So I click on just the green channel and I enable bit layer two. So I keep going down the bit layers and the moment I'm at bit layer two, um, or rather actually at bit layer zero, that's where I've encoded it, the deepest layer possible, only the sharpest eye will be able to detect that there is something funny going on in the black space. This is where all the encoding is. But visibly there is literally no distortion to the image. This is the final encoded image. If I were to load this, now this exploit is a little flaky. Um, it's not because my, my stegosploit technique is flaky, because it is because my exploit writing skills suck. Um, they, they don't suck that much, but they suck a little when it comes to stabilization. So you have to give it a couple of tries because I'm still working out the kinks with Firefox uh, JavaScript timing issues. But let me load this up straight away and see if we get a calc out of this. If we don't, um, let me click open the uh, task manager. Here you'll see that the heap spray is very swift. So here goes the heap spray and should finish in, in a short time. Okay, it didn't work. And we'll try it three times. So second out of two out of three chances. Let's see if the second one or the third one gets lucky. If it doesn't, I'm going to give up. Here it is, second time. Heap spray again. Cap. Okay, this time it worked. So, demonstration of different exploits, different browsers, different image formats. What about detection? Um, one of our friends, their company runs a private virus total. I'll never upload this on virus total because then those buggers will find out how it's all done. And I don't want to populate Google's AV engines. So upload it on their local virus total, everything green, no detection. So far, the detection rate is zero. This just passes as a very simple image. Um, okay, couple of points about uh, Package delivery. There's a few things that come in handy as far as browser hacking goes when it comes to delivering this polyglot to the browser. So how do we just make it load when you click a URL? You can use browser's content sniffing techniques. You can deliberately, if you control the web server, you can deliberately send out text HTML MIME types to force a JPEG load as HTML. And if you have all these JPEG markers being visually displayed in the DOM, you can use cascaded style sheets and colors to hide them or mask them to white on white so that you don't see them at all. With these two images, what I did is I simply removed the extension. I dropped the extension so the browser has to make a best guess as to what type of content is being served to me. This is a table I pulled out from the browser hacker's handbook by, uh, or, or not, not the browser hacker's handbook, the Tangled Web by Michael Zelewski. And he has a table on, uh, a Boolean table as to the criteria um, that will be applied by a browser to perform content sniffing or not. Content sniffing is basically inspecting the stream, the first few bytes of the stream, and making a decision on what type of image it is or what type of data blob it is simply by looking at the first 
couple of kilobytes or something. So for me, in this, both these cases, dropping the extension forced IE and Firefox to do content sniffing, and they picked up HTML first and rendered this as HTML. If not, I could have forced a text HTML mind type if I controlled the web server that the attack was being run from. But using content sniffing, what I can do is I don't need to control the web server. I can upload this anywhere and provide a direct link, and somebody just clicks a direct link, the exploit is served from Image Buckets browser, or uh, Image Buckets web server. The second technique I can use is clever caching. And this basically is a incident response nightmare. Let me show you how this is done. So if you make a get request and the web server serves you an expires tag, the browser will keep the object in the cache until the expiry date. The next time you try to look for it before the expiry date, the browser will not make a single request to the web server. So using this, I can basically give you time-shifted payloads. I deliver the exploit in the past and then trigger the exploit sometime in the present. So if I gave you an image three weeks ago with an expiry tag set to December, this image will be sitting in your cache. Now in December, when you actually get owned, your incident response team will come in, they'll start pulling, across, or pulling out all the network logs, they'll see nothing going across the wire. It just got owned from thin air. So how far does your recovery window actually go? This is another question to be thrown out. Right, so this is basically what Stegosploit is, as much as I could condense in about an hour's time. If you want more, let me point you to where all the goodies are. So okay, give me the damn tools. The tools are in POC or GTFO issue number eight. If you're really interested in the tools, grab a copy of POC or GTFO, which is an excellent publication, by the way. Every one of you should read it. Uh, POC or GTFO 9 has been published uh, recently in paper, and it's going to come out on the archives in a, in a week or two. But the beauty with POC or GTFO is that you need to know how to recover the tools from the journal. The tools are embedded in the PDF itself. That is a hint. You read it, figure out. Those of you can extract the tools. You're welcome to use it. I have licensed them under WTFPL. So the only one licensed text, do what the fuck you want. It's only fitting for POC or GTFO, right? Um, and for those of you who don't want to uh, risk loading a PDF onto your device, um, I put up the paper on stegosploit.info. This gives you a whole lot of more detail. I'll just glance you through the paper uh, uh, very quickly. But yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot of detail on the origins of the techniques, um, what motivated me to do this, uh, detailed discussion on steganography, encoding, exploit um, delivery, polyglots, image formats, delivery techniques, and a whole lot of references that I've borrowed. So you're welcome to read it in your leisure time. Share it with your friends. Um, and uh, see if you can use it in a pen test or two. It'll drive the detectors or the IPSs out of their minds. So a couple of conclusions before I wrap up. A couple of conclusions. In the offensive side of the spectrum, there's a lot of possibilities. You can do a whole lot of evil. It's only limited by your imagination and your control over the technology at hand. You can even use uh, cross-origin requests, like scores uh, and canvas to spread payloads. And I can see that this technique may also be applied to non-browser containers like Flash or PDF. That's another thing to work upon. If you do have any ideas to share, I'll be very happy to collaborate with you. As far as the defensive uh, spectrum goes, this is an incident response nightmare. How far back does your window of inspection go? Uh, no, to prove a point, again, we cannot rely on extensions, file headers, MIME types, magic numbers, signatures, or all this snake oil that we're using 
to detect offensive stuff coming at us with these boxes with blinking lights on it. We really need to apply different methods of detection, um, build in browser security at a core level, like compartmentalize a browser like a kernel is. Um, really, not, uh, re really not trust an image unless it decodes perfectly. There should be, if you're, if you're trying to read an image, it should be a pure image. Anything extra should be stripped from it. If you really want a quick fix to Stegosploit, and you're really worried about people uploading steganographic content on your servers, right now you can do a very simple fix. You can just resize the image, shrink it down one pixel by one pixel, um, subtract one pixel from the width and one pixel from the height, and then expand it back. And in the rejiggling, a whole lot of things die. Until I figure out how to do QR codes on it, which can survive resizing, for now there is a fix. So, um, that's it. Uh, that's pretty much the end of my talk. I want to thank uh, publicly Michael Zalewski, Angie Albertini, uh, Mario Heydrich, and my friend Kevin for lending his face for the exploit. Of course, to you, the audience, um, thanks for putting up with me, and uh, the fantastic 44 con crew, and that bus full of gin for making this event a whole lot of fun. Thank you very much. <laughs>